What's going on guys? Hope you're all doing well. So recently I uploaded a video all about why paleontology in general should thank the Jurassic Park franchise, specifically the first movie, for how much of a gigantic leap that was to their science being brought to the mainstream. But for today's video, I actually want to be on the opposite side of the aisle and play devil's advocate, talking about whether or not Jurassic Park films in general should even be scientifically accurate to begin with. I'm going to be using a lot of different things as reference to go into this video which I hope will actually lead some of you guys to make up your own opinions on the franchise, what to expect going forward as well as what's been going on in the past and how science should play a role in these movies. Now, I'm going to be using some material from a book that I really like and I think a lot of you will enjoy too called The Science of Jurassic Park and the Lost World or How to Build a Dinosaur. This is something that came out back around 1997 and it's a great companion to both the novels and films, the first two anyways, that I think would go a long way in a discussion like this. Of course, I'll also be using the Jurassic Park movies, the original movies, mainly the first one to kind of set a foundation for what should be expected in future and Installments. But with all that being said, there is still a lot of ground to cover when it comes to dinosaurs, paleontology, and science in this franchise in general. So paleontology obviously benefited greatly from Jurassic Park's success, but since that movie has come out, there have been a lot more recent discoveries that have depicted the animals way different to what we see in that movie. One of the more talked about differences happens to be feathers, and how much feathers, as well as what kind of feathers, should be on the dinosaurs. Tyrannosaurus rex is one that I think a lot of people go back and forth on when it comes to this sort of discussion, but I've heard both sides of the debate when it comes to including them or not including them and why it would or would not be scientifically accurate. Jurassic World Dominion, for example, chose to listen to the feather side of the argument and included small bits of them on the prehistoric T-Rex in the Cretaceous era flashback scene for that movie. Now, there have also been a lot of conversations on vocalization when it comes to this kind of dinosaur too, and that instead of the loud, iconic movie roar that it makes in the Jurassic Park films, it may have had some kind of lower pitch rumbling noise that sounded eerily different to anything we've seen on screen. Since 1993, there's actually been loads of different theories about this animal. I've already done a video on the scavenger exclusive theory proposed by Jack Horner, and more recent science says that the creature may have grown up to be around 70% bigger than we previously estimated, and there's even talk of the Tyrannosaurus having intelligence equivalent to something of a baboon, which I thought was really weird. But when it comes to the Jurassic Park franchise, things have stayed relatively the same. One other thing I've brought up before in the past has been the shrink wrapping effect that the dinosaurs have had in the Jurassic Park movies. This basically means that their bones are visibly seen in a similar way to their skeletons, which many believe would be very inaccurate to how they really looked in real life. And if anything, it would look like the animals were malnourished and or close to death. So how would an updated T-Rex look like if all of these theories were added into a new creature made for a new movie? Or better yet, what about adding lips, similarly to the prehistoric planet Tyrannosaur, which actually reminds me of a Roy Hess from the Dinosaurs TV series, by the way. But if you start with the point of view that it is Jurassic Park's responsibility to adhere 100% to scientific accuracy, because it's the biggest dinosaur franchise, it must adhere to that scientific outlook on a religious level, how would that be if all of these things were added to a new Tyrannosaur? And if they were, would that be complementary to the science world that has already been established in Jurassic Park from the first movie? And do you even care? So when we talk about scientific accuracy in the Jurassic Park movies, we should probably start with the status of the first one that came out in 1993. I already did the video talking about how much of a landmark and groundbreaking film it was for dinosaur science in general, but let's just talk about some of the things that it wasn't that scientifically accurate on uh, to begin with. So starting in 1993's Jurassic Park, we see that Alan Grant, a paleontologist that is basically just a guy that looks at 
bones and hasn't seen a real living dinosaur just yet, has already worked out that Tyrannosaurus rex has vision based on movement. This is not due to frog DNA like in Michael Crichton's books, and is specifically a paleontological theory and phenomenon that was proved right when he actually was on Isla Nublar. Now, of course, this is not scientifically accurate. Neither is the basis for which velociraptors having such high levels of intelligence that they were able to work out how to open a door or the whole Dilophosaurus with the frill and spitting venom. These are things that I think get talked about a lot when people complain about the inaccuracies of the original Jurassic Park, while all of the other stuff I mentioned in the other video gets brought up in support of it. So when it comes to this first movie, scientific accuracy in general. We can already see here that when it comes to dinosaurs and running around, being in certain positions with their skeletal frame structure and even the behavior that they display, the movie is pretty accurate to what we thought was going on at the time. But there are other things that are embellished for Hollywood, but they could also be the result of something else. Now, the T-Rex eyesight isn't really a part of this at all, but we do have to talk about the fact that the dinosaurs in the Jurassic Park universe are not 100% percent real dinosaurs. One of the things the science of Jurassic Park and the Lost World talks about a lot is the whole process by which mining amber, or more, I guess more specifically mosquitoes encased in amber, looking for DNA and then filling in the gaps to create a dinosaur is a very wild idea. And interestingly, at the very beginning of the book, they even state that the amber that was being mined in the Dominican Republic for Jurassic Park would not have any dinosaur DNA inside of it due to a lot of, you know, other factors in science in general. But that's not gonna stop Jurassic Park from being cool. And they even mention this in the book, which is completely fine in my own personal opinion. But when it comes to sequels after the Jurassic Park universe was already established, you'd think that all they'd really have to do is take what was established in that first movie and kind of go forward with that. Which in some cases they did, but in other entries they kind of went off in different directions. Mainly Jurassic World Dominion, which was playing with a totally different set of rules in my personal opinion. But when it comes to scientific accuracy in the original set of films, and even the first Jurassic World to some degree, I think what you're really dealing with here is not necessarily a story that's even trying to be 1000% representative of the paleontological science that dinosaurs are based on, because the story is actually one of genetics rather than paleontology. And it's also a cautionary tale warning against such things, which the book also does a really good job going into. Now, when it comes to future sequels in general, Jurassic World movies in particular, we've already established that the previous Jurassic Park lore in the books and films is kind of shaky when it comes to real world scientific accuracy, but I'm sure what you really want to talk about is paleontology. So I personally am of the opinion that anything done in the 1993 Steven Spielberg adaptation of Jurassic Park's book should be where everything goes forward from that if it is a sequel. Sure, they can do different ideas, incorporate other theories, and maybe even even embellish something due to genetic testing here and there, but really, you have one movie that kicks off the franchise, you should really branch out and kind of follow what's happened there in the future. So, what do I mean by that? Well, the dinosaurs like Dilophosaurus are so far removed from scientific accuracy that we can't really say that they are a paleontologically sound animal, even for the early 1990s. Does that mean that newer dinosaurs that are introduced in the canon, like Cryolophosaurus or maybe even something like an Adaphrosaurus, should they be something that is subject to scrutiny and extremely serious uh, paleo accuracy when it comes to a sequel? Well, I don't really think that's fair. That doesn't mean that every animal shouldn't have some basis in reality, because they absolutely should. But keep in mind here that dinosaurs in the Jurassic Park universe are not only genetic mutants that have amphibian DNA filling in their gaps, they are also different even from the real world and universe paleontological level. Like Alan Grant states that T Rexes have vision based on movement, not Robert Muldoon. So this is something different in The Rock. I'll also make a point of saying this though, there's other sequels like Jurassic Park 3 that have made a point of the Velociraptors being smarter than dolphins, whales, or primates, which is further embellishment by the paleontologists and not really the Jurassic Park genetic world in general. But that doesn't mean they shouldn't hold some form of realism into their representation at all. I personally think like 
one of the coolest things to do in a Jurassic Park movie would actually be to have the dinosaurs that engine bred running around doing wild stuff like they normally do, but then having a different company, let's say Biosyn for example, creating brand new more authentic dinosaurs, but, and I know they did this to an extent in Dominion, but I would really love for them to actually talk about this in the plot. That doesn't mean you go buy a checklist of, oh look, their wrists aren't broken, oh look, they've got a specific type of feathers, oh look, they're not you know, shrink wrapped when it comes to the skeletal portrayal around the dinosaur's skin and stuff like that. What I mean is, instead of having a Giganotosaurus or Spinosaurus fight a T-Rex, why not have an engine T-Rex fight a Biosyn T-Rex that is completely different looking in general? Maybe have some sort of lips, a different skeletal frame and not so much shrink wrapping. And I don't really think that would break the canon or do anything too wild in comparison to what they've already done. The benefits of adding more scientific accuracy to the Jurassic Park dinosaurs would basically be updating the animals from the 1990s and early 2000s. So you'd have some things that are obviously different from what we knew of the animals from the early 90s. However, I don't really know if you should go full-fledged 100% to this for every single species because, in truth, that's kind of going against what Jurassic Park is about to begin with. One of my favorite comments I got on my last video on paleontology in Jurassic Park was, Jurassic Park had every right in its story to not be paleontologically accurate. It had actual, legitimate excuses in the story. And as accurate as that movie was, let alone how groundbreaking for dinosaur films and representation in general for 1993, it still kicked a lot of butt. So with that being said, I do think that this is a serious conversation of design, creature work, and just basic science that should be discussed when it comes to making new dinosaurs in the series. If you just throw in a hyper-realistic Velociraptor Mongoliensis that's cutting edge and the pinnacle of science in the modern world, uh, you're not really going to be doing yourself any favor if you verbally say on screen, my creature is a 100% accurate representation of the animal. Because, as we all know with paleontology, in a couple of years, that representation will not be accurate, especially in regards to something like the Spinosaurus. And even with animals like Tyrannosaurus, we've got all of these differing points of view that are very, very serious for people that love stuff like that. I I think it's better to actually err on what Jurassic Park is all about to begin with, which is a genetic story more than a paleontological one. But even with it being genetics based in a cautionary tale against what's going on with, you know, human folly, I do think it is a cool idea to make more scientifically accurate animals and juxtaposing them with what was going on in the 1990s. When it comes to these movies though, it's not really just the paleontology that is science based and, you know, dealing with the plot. Let's not forget that the whole manner in which the dinosaurs were created had nothing really to do with paleontology and was more of a genetics based science idea. And it was what a lot of people were talking about back in the day. Remember, mosquitoes trapped in amber for 65 million years being drilled into to extract blood from to then morph that blood with other blood that we have available to fill in the gene sequence gaps. That's way more than paleontology. So when it comes to scientific accuracy, there's a lot going on here. Let alone logistics, which is something that I think a lot of people overlook in Jurassic Park storytelling, but something that, if you're a fan of the first novel in particular, Michael Crichton was all about talking about, you know, different memos, different ideas and blueprints of what was happening within the theme park, chaos theory, the hubris of man and doing these wild things. It's, it's really, really cool stuff. And that book, by the way, was the basis of what Steven Spielberg was running with for the film. Here's a cool excerpt from the book that I think you guys will find enjoyable. You're tagging along with Alan Grant, Ellie Sattler, and Ian Malcolm on their first visit to Jurassic Park. Henry Wu, the enthusiastic chief geneticist, lured away from what John Hammond derisively calls the intellectual backwaters of university research, is showing you around the lavishly equipped research laboratories of Nublar. Better than anything he could have aspired to in 
the uncertain, cost-conscious academic world. Wu is explaining how they get dinosaur DNA. First, they collect blood-sucking insects of the right age, preserved in amber. Second, with a microscope and a fine syringe, they poke into the insects' stomachs to see what they can find. Only a few insects have any dinosaur blood in them, but for each dinosaur species, they need only one blood sample. Third, when they found a suitable blood sample, they carefully draw into the syringe as many red blood cells as they can find. Any one of those little cells contains the entire DNA of the creature it came from. Wu admits that the DNA they find this way might not be perfectly preserved, but says they've come up with methods to patch together pieces that have fallen apart, and even to fill in the occasional gaps. Nevertheless, once they've got hold of a single dinosaur blood cell, they've basically solved the problem. One of the things they do a really good job at talking about as well is, genetically speaking, how different the dinosaurs would be from even a conceptual level as far as the clones go. This is something that The Lost World by Michael Crichton touched on a lot, and it's something that the story is kind of hinging on when it comes to how these animals are different from their paleontological kin. To quote the book, the velociraptors of Jurassic Park and The Lost World are an odd case. They are greedy, selfish, and aggressive. Aggressive toward each other, and even toward their own infants. On the other hand, they're also skillful pack hunters and appear to put their rivalries aside while chasing their prey. One raptor will maneuver a weak, straying triceratops away from its herd, while another waits in hiding to pounce on the prey. But how did orphan raptors acquire the cooperative skills needed for hunting while remaining completely devoid of the similarly cooperative skills needed for living and surviving in a pack? In particular, the idea that raptors would deny food to their own infants is difficult to believe. Most animals display an instinctive protectiveness toward their offspring, their own offspring at least. Without this instinct, no species is likely to survive. Who knows what basic survival skills mother dinosaurs or a herd of adult dinosaurs would have taught dinosaur youngsters. Surprisingly, paleontologists have been able to make a few simple inferences about the way some dinosaurs raise their young. So right off the bat, they're already mentioning how the dinosaurs of the Jurassic Park book universe, and similarly the movies, are kind of very different different instinctively to what they've uncovered in the fossil record. But one of the more interesting things about scientific accuracy and really believability when it comes to the universe was the idea that Isla Nublar would be this kind of haven for animals to live on inside of the Jurassic Park environment. They even go this entire summary of how many animals the Tyrannosaurus would have to eat, how many giant sauropods were housed on the island, and what kind of problems Hammond would run into on Nublar during the course of Jurassic Park's, you know, duration. Again, to quote the book, it's starting to look as if the whole of Isla Nublar is getting taken up with meadows and grasslands for the plant eaters, and we've still got to find room for the carnivores and the goat farm to supply them. And let's not forget that the island is described as a volcanic upthrusting of rock, a rugged and craggy place with forested slopes. Sounds as if a good part of the island would not be happy to rain for the myosaurs and apatosaurs, which like grassy plains, not forests or craggy slopes. But they do also mention the other island in the book, which I found to be really fun. Site B, the lost world of Isla Sorna, is a different proposition. There, things have been left to go wild for several years by the time the good guys discover the island, and when they arrive, they find a lush place teeming with life and large populations of dinosaurs, apparently doing pretty well for themselves. What's more, the island itself seems to be in good shape, with plenty of thick vegetation, trees, and meadows. In the lost world, Michael Crichton unfortunately didn't pass on to us the detailed memos and observation notes that paleontologist Richard Levine must surely have made. He spots herds of apatosaurs, myosaurs, triceratops, parasaurs, ipsilophodons, and other herbivores. Toward the end of the book, when Sarah Harding is trying to restart a broken down vehicle, a herd of some 50 pachycephalosaurs, each about six feet tall, puts in an appearance. In the Velociraptor's disheveled lair are four apatosaur skeletons, the remains of animals that died and were carried to raptor territory by a river, then eaten by the raptors. All in all, Ian Malcolm estimates that there are a couple of hundred animals on the island, maybe as many as 500. It's unclear whether he's simply estimating the numbers of big animals here, but there are also numerous chicken-sized compies and rat-sized moosaurs. So apparently, there are as many, if not more, animals on Isla Sorna as there were on Nublar. The dimensions of Site B are not explicitly given, but judging by a map in the book and the distance the protagonists travel in their jeeps, it's somewhat bigger than Isla Nublar. Let's say 100 plus square miles. Even so, since we've established 
that Nublar was nowhere near big enough for the animals on it to form self-sufficient populations, it's unlikely that Site B is big enough for its dinosaurs to have lasted five years without killing each other off, or at the very least, destroying the landscape and vegetation. Coincidentally, that's kind of what the Lost World book was all about, and while that wasn't something that was truly adapted in the movie, that was a big point of the source material. Extinction was always a big part of Michael Crichton's second novel. In conclusion, I want to just remind everybody that the Jurassic Park franchise is one about, you know, really playing God and creating monsters that are bred from dinosaur DNA as well as amphibian. It's more of a Frankenstein story than it is National Geographic, and while I do think that more scientifically accurate dinosaurs should be a part of the plot, I don't necessarily think they should be the focal point and focus because that's not really what the story is all about. I have heard some people say that because Jurassic Park is the premier dinosaur franchise that it holds responsibility and it's, you know, what people are going to look to dinosaurs for, you know, basic ideas of first and foremost. But I think that's kind of unfair. I understand where they're coming from, but just because Jurassic Park is the greatest dinosaur franchise out there doesn't mean that it's that film's responsibility, or rather the sequels in general, to really be the forefront of scientific progression for paleontology specifically. And there's a lot of reasons for why I think that. First and foremost, for what I've named in this video, logistically, scientific accuracy isn't really something Jurassic has in its DNA, <laughs> pun intended, for the actual plot. You know, it's, it's it was never really 100% accurate to begin with. It was all theories, conjecture, and science fiction, which I think is something we need to remember. However, if I was the one making a Jurassic Park movie, like like I said, I think one of the cooler ideas would actually be to showcase an engine animal from the 1990s against a biosyn or manticore or whatever you want to call it, new genetics company creature that was their own creation. You can even be as simple as saying, our genetic research is more advanced right here in extracting DNA from amber. And instead of using amphibian DNA to fill in the gaps, we've used avian DNA. For example, if they want to release some sort of movie where they go into Velociraptor Antaropus and say, actually, we're going to call it Deinonychus Antaropus this time, totally looking at the camera why they do it, whatever, and say that instead of a frog, they've used hawk, eagle, or even an ostrich to like fill in the gaps for the raptor DNA. You might not think that that would be an extremely elaborate change in presentation for the animal in real life, but guess what? This is a Jurassic Park movie, so you can kind of do something like that in the story. But for me, what I would probably have in mind would be the great idea to hiring out not one, but several several paleontologists and going over all of their opinions on specific dinosaur traits and looks that we haven't seen before. One dinosaur I love that I have never seen it in a Jurassic Park movie, but it would be really cool, would be Platyosaurus. I'd get my friend Gary Vecchiarelli on because he's a Triassic expert and be like, dude, tell me everything you know about Platyosaurus. Let me know how we can produce the most authentic looking Platyosaurus ever for a Jurassic Park sequel. And then you create something like that and do a Cryolophosaurus that was just just found from engine and it has some sort of crazy mockingbird cry that uh, replicates you know human voices to lure in prey or something but that's only because of the genetic abnormalities that were infused into its blood to begin with so it's a cautionary warning science fiction but there's also really cool cutting-edge science dinosaurs alongside them at the end of the day I'm gonna throw this question to you guys because this is something that people love to scream about and I understand why but in relation to the Jurassic Park brand starting with the 1993 film in general, which I've already gone over, is not exactly as scientifically sound as paleontologically groundbreaking it was for the 90s. I think it's a good conversation to be had. What are your thoughts on scientific accuracy in the Jurassic Park universe? And do you think that the newer movie should throw everything the first one did away and instead go for a more hard-edged scientific academic paper focused thing on every individual species? And if so, I'd love to ask the question of where you would go for creatures like Spinosaurus, because with an animal like that, what I consider to be the most controversial dinosaur ever, because of all the paleontological studies around it, I do wonder and ask how you would approach a creature like that. Again, I love the dinosaurs and paleontology in general, and it'd be really cool to see more accurate ones in this franchise. But I don't think that should be the focus of a story that is at the end of the day a cautionary warning for genetics more than it is a paleontological education. 
educational lesson. But a lot of this is important to the franchise. So whatever your own thoughts and opinions happen to be, I'd love to hear them in the comments down below. Now before I go, I'd like to thank all of my game wardens and engine executives, as well as all of my park workers and engine hunters as well. You've all helped my channel immensely and I'm incredibly grateful for all of that support. Now I'd like to thank you all for watching today's video and hope that you enjoyed the content. If you feel like I deserve it, I'd appreciate the like and hope that you all consider subscribing. I'll see you all in the next video guys and as always, take it easy.